So talking last week, we were talking about faith and tradition, the understanding of also authority, interpretation of scriptures, how to interpret scriptures and things of that nature. But I also wanted to cover the topic of authority in the church, especially because this is the Catholic Church, and you'll come to discover the Catholic Church does believe very strongly in authority, scriptural authority, apostolic authority, bishop's authority, because, and it's not because the authority in the church is meant to be controlling, although at times it can be perceived that way, and in the past, and sometimes in reality, can actually at times have been misused and been controlling, but without authority, you're not able to get anything done. You have to have authority. Jesus gives authority to the apostles because he wants them to be effective in the world. And so without authority is actually one of the most important things that we have because authority is also meant and used to teach as well as to protect. And so in the church, we use the term authority, but we also recognize that there's four different levels of authority, especially when talking about promoting and teaching the gospel. And by baptism, everyone has a certain type of authority to promote in the gospel as well as to go out and spread the good news. But when you're talking about authority in terms of well, when you have two people who disagree on the interpretation of scriptures, or you have two people who disagree fundamentally, and it's not just a disagreement, but it's a fundamental difference between the ideologies behind morality and things like that, then the question becomes, how do you know which one is right? And so from the Catholic perspective, you go to the person who is the competent authority, the competent expert. And in some cases, that might be the bishop, some cases that might be the pope, some cases that might actually be a parent because we also believe that parents have authority to teach. That's actually one of the things that parents take on when they baptize their children, is they take on the responsibility of teaching their children, and therefore they are given authority in that. And actually God has given them authority just by dint of the relationship. So the first level of authority, which is actually the most effective authority that, which is used in the church in terms of promoting the gospel is what we call the lives of the saints. And the lives of the saints are important because in the lives of the saints, you'll find all of them were sinful. All of them screwed up. All of them made mistakes. One of my favorite is St. Jerome, who a couple days ago, actually, we actually celebrated his feast day because we celebrate and we remember various saints in the Catholic liturgical year. Um, we pray through them. We ask them to bring our prayers to God because they're in heaven and that they still have that role in our life to help us. The role of the saints, though, you look at pretty much every single saint all of them were broken, all of them were flawed, all of them had problems. St. Jerome, who was the first person to actually translate the Bible so that people could understand it into Latin, which is the first Bible, it was called the Latin Vulgate. St. Jerome was also known for having the nastiest mouth of his time. He was known for actually having a caustic mouth using foul language, that he was known for being acerbic, he was known for being nasty, he was known for not being the nicest person. Actually, Augustine, St. Saint Augustine, who some of you might know from his contributions to theology, the city of God and things like this, St. Augustine was a bishop in the early church who really didn't get along with, with Jerome all the time. And actually, we still have some of St. Jerome's writings where he says to Augustine, I curse you with the fleas of a thousand armpit hairs. He basically says, I hope you get lice. <laughs> That's what he says. Because they're arguing about what books are supposed to be in the Bible. It's actually what the argument was because Jerome's translated. And so in this, you'll find that actually Jerome, supposedly, every time that St. Jerome said something which was nasty, though, he knew it was wrong, and he'd actually take a rock, and he'd hit himself trying to train himself to stop doing this. So supposedly, Jerome's body was covered in bruises. Uh, St. Augustine, one of the greatest saints in the church, a great theologian, contributed much to our understanding of sin, and understanding of the mercy of God and things of this nature, but St. Augustine also had a lot of problems like King David with uh, a well-developed sexuality, sometimes an overdeveloped sexuality. St. Augustine's famous phrase is, oh beauty, how late have I loved you? But probably one that most other people know even more than that is, Lord, give me purity, just not yet. <laughs> so in all the lives of the saints, you'll see men and women who were flawed. St. Therese of Avila, one of the great saints and mystics of the church, one of the founders of the Carmelite movement. Carmelite, correct? Yeah, Carmelite. So, it's, but I know that one day that she was traveling around and she came back and it was raining and it was muggy. She was getting out of a carriage and she slipped and fell face first into the mud and she had been sick and she was angry and she was frustrated. So she turned around on her back and shook her fist at the heavens and said, God, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few. So with all the saints, if you actually read the lives of the saints, if you read their biographies, 
if you read about their lives, you'll find people who are very relatable to, actually. Uh, Mother Teresa, our Saint Teresa of Calcutta now, are one of our most modern day saints who've been recently canonized and made a saint. She struggled with not feeling the presence of God for years, for actually the majority of her ministry. So people who go through real struggles, and that's why the saints, when we read the lives of the saints, we don't say that these people are gods or anything like this. We say that these people have something to teach us. They are people who were Christians who struggled, who got it right. And the church actually looks at the lives of what we call saints and says, certain people have done an extraordinarily good job. And these people's lives are worthy of emulation in the ways in which they succeeded. And these people are worthy of actually looking to examples of what a disciple actually looks like. And so the most effective authority is also the one which you'll also find a lot of the most flaws. It's interesting that within the flaws of people is oftentimes the greatest strengths. Because especially for promoting the gospel. The second level of authority that we have in the church belongs to parents. Parents are the most effective communicators and teachers of the faith to their children. Which is why the responsibility to parent, for parents to teach their children, to take an interest in their spiritual lives with their children, is that they have a real authority and that actually they will be judged by God and how well they were given and used this gift. The third level of authority in the church, of people who have a right as well as a responsibility to teach, is what we refer to as religious catechists and religious educators. People in CCD classes, RCAA teachers, um, all different types of persons who have more of an official position in the church or who are teaching and educating, they usually are going to make hopefully less theological errors than parents. <laughs> parents, many parents don't have a the theological background. They have to go to the priest, they have to go and get help, they have to go and look the, up things themselves. But a lot of, again, religious educators and catechists hopefully have a higher level of training and therefore they will make fewer mistakes. And so there's a little bit more authority, but actually on a personal level, religious educators and catechists are not as effective as parents. See, the more that you get into less mistakes, actually the less effective you have because it's also the more distant from personal relationship. The highest authority in the church, so after you have religious educators, which is males and females, um, you could even say that priests and nuns fall into this category as well, you also will have the fourth level, which is called the magisterium. The magisterium of the church the official teaching body of the church. That's what this means, magisterium, the official teaching body. That there's three different parts of the magisterium. The first part of the magisterium is called the scholars. The people who are scholars who are looked to as being experts in their fields of study. And that the magisterium looks to scholars to help and to advise them. Then you have in the magisterium what's called the magisterium cathedra, magistrates or the magistrates. The theologians, the ones who are able to speak on the theological matters, who are experts in their fields of theology. Not a scholar can be a scholar in anything. You can be a scholar in science, and actually the church makes use of scholars in science. It makes use of science in, in sociology or in psychology or things like that. And they actually listen to all the scholarly research which is going on in the world today when making determinations on any particular field of study. But then you have the theologians who are specifically on matters of spirituality and of religion and of faith as it pertains to Catholicism and to Judaism and things like this. So theologians, the Magisterium Cathedra Magistralis versus bishops, bishops which are called Magisterium Cathedra Pastoralis, pastors versus magistrates. If that makes sense. That's where the, both the terms come from, magistrate and then pastor, the shepherds, the shepherds versus the judges, if that makes sense. And so within the magisterium of the church, this is what's called the ordinary magisterium. This is the ordinary way, the ordinary body who makes determinations on the official teachings of the Catholic Church. And we've had this actually since the very beginning. The first magisterium was the Twelve, who also were looking and being advised by other persons outside of that. The Twelve were the first Twelve shepherds, the first pastors. And so within this, at the first, you'll see that the first council of Jerusalem where they had to make determinations on where the Holy Spirit was leading and guiding them on, okay, Jesus told us that the Spirit would guide us into all things. And Jesus also told us, there's not enough time for me to tell you everything you need to know. That's why the Holy Spirit will tell you what you need to know once I'm gone. And so the first council of Jerusalem is what's referred to as the first council. And councils are the ordinary way in which the official teachings of the church come out and are promoted and promulgated. 
So the second one was called the Council of Nicaea. Most of you probably still know the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed, and that's what it actually called. Now at times, different, different persons will call for different councils. The Council of Nicaea was actually called by the Emperor Constantine. So they will always be called by various, sometimes they'll be called by the Pope, sometimes they'll be called by popular acclaim. Sometimes be, there's lots of different ways in which councils are called for, but it's always this body who comes together to make a determination on whatever the question is at hand. So, within this, you'll also find that males and females are both represented. Because females can be within the magisterium of theologians, as well as within scholars. It is true that within the magisterium of the bishops, that this is what, where you'll find the twelve being chosen twelve men by Jesus. And we still have that the, all bishops and priests are men. And we'll get to that more when we get to the sacrament of holy orders, why that is on a deeper level. But just to say that, because sometimes people don't think that women are included in the magisterium of the church, that's actually not accurate, because they are held in very high degree. That's why Pope Francis has been recently saying, we want more women theologians. We want more, we need more of a female contribution to the actual um, teaching faculty of the church. That's why he also promoted, I don't know if you know this, he took Mary Magdalene as a, and took her as a saint, and he actually elevated her normal feast day, which was a normal feast day, and he elevated it to a high feast. Because he was trying to say, please, we want more female saints. We want more female theologians, trying to encourage them into the fields, which he says is where we can do that. And so, within though, the magisterium, cathedra, magistralis, you'll find that there's a specific function within the pastors though, not the magistrates, not the judges, but the pastors. We do believe that in very certain circumstances that the pastors, the, in very controlled circumstances, that they can speak on matters of faith and morals, being guided by the Holy Spirit, and that they do not make errors. That, now, just because they don't make errors doesn't mean it's going to be complete. Doesn't mean it's gonna be universal and all of a sudden complete, that they know everything about something. But when they speak on matters of faith and morals, in a very controlled environment called the Ordinary Teaching Office of the Church, which is the councils, is that the councils do not make errors. There might be later developments out of councils. So something, that's where you'll find, even last week's reading, this past week's reading, our faith is the size of a mustard seed. That mustard seed never changes, but it does grow and evolve. And so you'll see the sacraments, you'll see the teachings of the church, you will see them evolve over time, as the mustard seed grows, but you'll never see it change fundamentally where we go from this position to the exact opposite contrary position in questions of faith or morals. Now in practices, the Catholic Church in practice has made many mistakes. Made many mistakes, selling of indulgences, which is oftentimes many, one that most people know from the Middle Ages from Martin Luther, was most certainly a mistake. It was never part of actually the official teachings of the church. It was a custom that people got into the practice of, and it was always a violation of our moral laws and things like that. Or you'll get into different practices of what's called simony in the 10th century, the buying and selling of church offices, which actually brought about the reason for why priests were only chosen from celibates, because married priests, they had a bunch of problems in the 9th and 10th centuries, uh, as most married people want to do, they want to take care of their families. Well, priests don't own anything for the most part that is made use of in the church. So I don't own anything. The only thing I own is my car <laughs> and a couple of my personal possessions. I don't own anything for the most part that I use unless I bought it. But see, the church buys lots of things. And so actually what happened in the, middle age, the early Middle Ages is that you had a lot of married clerics who were taking the possessions of the church and were leaving them to their children. And sometimes this wasn't just chalices and just wasn't different objects. Sometimes it was whole churches. Or sometimes it was actually entire dioceses, entire areas, when it was a very powerful bishop or something like that who was married or a very powerful priest who was very politically connected. So you have what was called the practice of simony, the buying and selling of church offices. And it was very much connected to married priests wanting to take care of it, as most people do. But there was, again, a violation of different laws and it was causing huge problems because basically priests were turning into thieves. And so the Finally, Gregory VII got so fed up and tired of it, he said, you know what, we're only choosing our priests from among those who have chosen celibacy. He said, I'm tired, we're tired of this. We're tired of all this. And actually, it did actually solve the problem for the most part of simony, um, which we really haven't seen. Most people don't even know that word, simony, which actually goes back to Simon from the book of Acts, 
Simon who's buying and selling things illegal and things of like that. So when you look at this, although simony was at times practiced and at times done, it was never permitted in the church. It was always a violation of the law. It was always a violation of morality and things like this. So you will find that the church in practice, members of the church in practice, have made many mistakes through the centuries, but we don't believe that the actual official teachings that have come out of councils have ever contained errors, at least that they were fundamentally wrong. And if you can find one, please bring it up to me. I would love to talk to you about it because I haven't been able to find one yet. <laughs> I thought I found things which I thought were wrong, and then I studied it further and I started to understand it, and I was able, the same thing is actually true with scripture. We don't believe that there's anything in scripture which is wrong. Depending on your translation, though, and depending upon your interpretation, you can make things which are wrong. Because if you try to interpret the poetry of the church, I mean, the poetry of the Bible, the book of Psalms, the way you interpret the history of the historical books of the Bible, it's two different types of literature, two different types of forms. And each of them require a different type of interpretation. And so when you interpret things inaccurately, yeah, you can find a lot of people who try to look at the Bible as a scientific document. The Bible is not written as a scientific document. It's not meant to be a scientific document. If you try to apply scientific principles, you will find mistakes in the Bible. But that was never the intent of the scriptures. That was never the intent of the author. And that was most certainly not ever the intent of God. But there is an intent there. That's where we say that the intent, and likewise the real interpretation of the scriptures, that there is no error there, if that makes sense. We'll get into that a little bit more later as well. So, the use of inerrant authority is not unilateral. Not every time that a bishop speaks is he making use of the inerrant authorities. And actually, this is even true of the Pope. Every time that the Pope speaks doesn't mean that he's infallible. When Pope Francis speaks, pretty much as he does every single day, and he's speaking off the cuff, the man makes mistakes, just like all of us do. But in those very controlled environment, in that very controlled which the councils of the church the most recent was the Second Vatican Council, which is the ordinary. And there are extreme circumstances where we do believe the Pope in very controlled circumstances, which is called when he speaks ex cathedra. This has only happened three times in history, where the Pope has made a, a declarative statement on a matter of faith and morals from the chair of Peter using the power of the keys. It's happened three times. And so in that, we'll get to that again later on when we get to the priestly office and the priestly authority and things like that in our, our class on the priests priesthood. But still, that we do believe that being guided and led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who does not make errors and who inspired the scriptures to contain no errors, but still that they need to be interpreted. Which is why I do a lot of interpreting for what Pope Francis is actually saying. <laughs> because <laughs> the mass media, I'll tell you this, the media takes Francis out of context all the time. All the time Francis is being taken out of context. People think that Francis is like the bipolar opposite of Pope Benedict the 16th. If you compare the two of their writings, you won't be able to tell usually the difference between the two writings because they're saying they have a different lens, a different focus on what they're focusing on, but they are not contradicting each other ever. Actually, I've actually pointed out and I've said, I, point, I, I passed this across, I said, this is what Francis said. And I gave someone a document and they're like, oh, this is great, this is great, this is great, I love it. And I was like, it's Benedict. <laughs> They're like, what? It's context. It's context. And likewise, people's perceptions and things like that. So the, the popes, but still, when they make use of that inerrant authority, it's very, very rare for the most part. But we still do think, we still see their guidance and all bishops' guidance as being important because although they're not, they're, these men are not stupid, they're also highly trained, but they do make mistakes. I'd say that that hat is a mistake. <laughs> John Paul II, they're men. So what I'm referring to in talking about the official teaching body of the church, the magisterium of the church, is the highest level of teaching, which we believe is something which is meant to be applied in our daily lives, make a difference in our daily lives. But this affects us. It's called the dogmas. The dogmas of the church. We believe that these were revealed to us by God, by the divine, through the ordinary or extraordinary, through a council or through an infallible statement of the Pope. That this is the ordinary and extraordinary form. These are what's called the dogmas. And the dogmas, we do believe, don't contain errors. The dogma of the Trinity, for instance. You won't find the word Trinity in the Bible. The Trinity is something which is affirmed at the councils of the church, starting with Nicaea, and it's further developed over time. 
as it, what does this actually mean in entail? So the Trinity is a dogma. Actually, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is a dogma. You can find these things in Scripture, not always explicitly, but you can always find them implicitly. You can find the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist in John chapter 6. You can find the Trinity all over the place if you know what to look for. But these things are sometimes not always immediately apparent. So, uh, revealed through the divine, the definitive doctrines are necessary to understand the dogmas. So these are things which have led out of the dogmas to help us better understand those dogmas. And this source, we believe, is divine and human. These also contain no errors. Um, as opposed to the first top, the highest one, which is more of a directly by God. So, for instance, one of, this, one of the examples of a doctrine, a definitive doctrine, something which is not going to change, is what we refer to as transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, the way that we describe the Eucharist, the change that happens in the bread and the wine. Now, will you find the word transubstantiation in the Bible? No, you won't. It didn't come about until the 12th century with St. Thomas Aquinas, who used the philosophy of Aristotle to try to give us a better understanding of what is possibly going on in the Eucharist. And actually, when the church affirmed the language of transubstantiation, I believe it was at the Council of Trent, that when they affirmed it, they said, this is an apt and fitting way to understand the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. That's what it said. If we ever come up with better language than transubstantiation, we might use it. But we'll never say that the language of transubstantiation is wrong. It's what? It's the best we can come up with right now. And therefore, it's a definitive doctrine. Then you have below that, you have non-definitive doctrines. Non-definitive doctrines are necessary to understand either the dogmas or the doctrines, but the source of this is more of human slash divine versus the top, the other one is gonna be, you're gonna see more of where God is speaking directly. The second one will be more of where you're gonna find a lot more of the human element. And actually in the non-definitive doc doctrines, you could, you could actually find errors. The applications of things oftentimes, where you'll find a lot of people will actually put the application of our definitive dogmas and doctrines into, for instance, like ethics. Although ethics, the principles that we base upon in ethics are oftentimes doctrines and dogmas. The application, depending on varying sciences and things like that, that's why we have a whole field of study of Catholic ethics where we look and say, how do we live out our faith and does this actually violate it? But science is always changing in terms of our knowledge of it. Even like questions like cloning. Well, we know that cloning, certain types of cloning are violations of God's plan, violations of God's law, they're ab abhorrent. But actually there's certain types of cloning which don't violate the principles of our faith. But that's why, what, as you start getting more nuances in the fields of science and things like that, there could be at times mistakes which are made in this field. But we're using the principles which we understand, for instance, the value of human life. That is a definitive dogma. <laughs> because life is created in the image and likeness of God. We cannot casually take it away. Which is why when we look at certain practices and we say that, no, this is, this is taking away life, abortion, is actually falls into the teaching of the church on abortion, which is morals, falls into the level of definitive, doct definitive doctrine. Actually, you could even say it falls into even deeper because you'll find that even mentioned in scriptures directly how it's a violation of God's plan, which is part of also what I preached on this past weekend. So when you, but you look at various things, but are you gonna find like the idea of taking a person off a respirator? Or are you gonna find, which you actually can do, there's a, you morally allow people to die. That's very different than when you inject a person with a substance to kill them, where you are the active cause versus you are allowing the natural death process to it. But we'll get more into medical ethics when we get into our second section, when we go over the, especially the Ten Commandments. But I just want you to be aware of these different, oh, yes, sorry, <laughs> these different levels, because this is when we talk about the magisterium of the church is what we're referring to is, so, in this, though, we're pretty certain, though, that the non-definitive doctrines don't contain error. We do our best to make sure then that they don't. But the, there could be, at times, mistakes made, especially if we don't fully understand the field, but we're applying, insofar as we know, our principles to a particular field of study. Does this make sense? Because we do believe, as Catholics, that our faith, our dogmas and doctrines, what God has revealed to us, makes a difference in our daily lives. It makes a difference in the way in which we actually even act and move. Below non-definitive doctrines, you'll, call, you'll find what's called providential guidance. 
This is oftentimes for the well ordering of a diocese, how a bishop leads and guides the diocese. Every bishop actually is able to lead and guide his diocese for the most part how he wants. The Pope creates general overarching laws, but each bishop in the church is for the most part the pastor of that particular diocese and the Pope just can't walk into any diocese and start changing things. That, if we believe in the church that all bishops, even the Pope, there, there's a principle of what we call collegiality. It's like a college of cardinal, college of bishops, a college, like we think of in the academic sense, actually. The Pope is the head dean, and he can make administrative laws that affect the entire Roman church, but he just can't go into any department and start telling a professor in that class or a dean in that department how to run his department or things like that. He can give overarching principles, so there is actually checks and balances within even the way in which the church works, because providential guidance will also be fall into the applications of dogmas and doctrines in specific circumstances, as well as how different dioceses are run and things like this. Um, and actually, to be a faithful Catholic, faithfulness is, this is where you'll also find a lot of times a bishop will say what to do in a particular case, like uh, the Terry Shavo case, before there was ever anything which came out officially, there was like indications the bishop wrote a letter to a people. You'll sometimes see bishops writing letters about what to do in a particular case. And there's not, it's not going to be a council held to do this, but you'll get providential guidance. Does that make sense? So like if there's also a big, huge issue that comes out, you'll oftentimes get providential guidance from the pulpit. Providential guidance can also contain mistakes. <laughs> but it's going to be, there is a certain level of wisdom. We don't believe that this is just like people are not thinking behind this. There's a lot of thought that goes into anything that is done on this level because there's also every priest and bishop knows there's going to be a lot of scrutiny, especially in today's modern world. So we don't like making mistakes. I don't think anyone likes making mistakes. So we do our best, but there could be mistakes in these two levels. But actually all Catholics in terms of faithfulness, all Catholics are called to be obedient to all four levels. We do call for obedience in all four levels because that's also what the, we fall into the fourth commandment is that even in times where people can make mistake, if it's a just authority and it's not telling you to do something wrong, you're not ever called to be obedient to something which is telling you to do something wrong, violations of God's law. But if it's not, if it's questions of prudence, we do believe that there's a certain level where we're called to be obedient because the, the opposite of that, the consequence of you're not, is chaos and anarchy. We are a slightly organized religion. I'd say that we're probably the most disorganized religion in the world, but we do have some type of order within the church for the well structure because when you have a billion people who are members of your church you'll find that you need some of these things the last one is what I refer to as friendly advice you can take this with a rule you can take this as with a grain of salt you ask me for friendly advice again this might seem complicated so yeah I'm not expecting you all to know this but I just wanted you to be aware that this is out there as well as kind of the uh, the structure about by which we do things you also, you can disagree with providential guidance, and you can disagree at times, you have to be obedient to both providential guidance and non-definitive dogmas. No Catholic to be faithful, if you want to be faithful, which we hopefully want to be faithful, uh, no Catholic to be faithful can disagree with the doctrine or dogma. This is required by faith. This is manifested by faith. This is what's required. The dogmas and doctrines our faith and morals are things that all Catholics are called to adhere to, and they can't dissent from this. You can't disagree with this, because if you disagree, I can tell you, you're wrong. <laughs> and it's not, I'm, I'm not telling you you're wrong, it's you're disagreeing with the Holy Spirit, because we don't believe that it's the men who are doing this, we believe that this is the Holy Spirit who's leading and guiding and speaking to us today. Which is why I said this weekend, for those of you who heard me, I said that all Catholics, one of the fundamental requirements of being a faithful Catholic is that we stand united against abortion. Because this is not an option. You can't dissent from this teaching. Because abortion goes to the fundamental dogma that we understand about the value of human life. It goes also into the Ten Commandments. These are also dogmatic understandings of our faith. So there are certain things that, again, people can disagree with, but it's also when people start saying, well, I disagree, I dissent from this teaching, or I dissent from that teaching. What they oftentimes are dissenting from is dogmas and doctrines. And that's not an option in terms of at least being faithful. And there's a lot of people in the world today who say, well, I'm a, I'm a Catholic and things like that, but they don't ascribe to the dogmas and doctrines. So I'm not gonna say they're not Baptist, Catholic by, by baptism, but in terms of faithfulness, they're not, they're not faithful. 
if that makes sense. Does this make sense? So this is, there is a criterion which we use, which is, again, but we also try to give people time. It's different to have a struggle with the teaching of the church. It's different to struggle than to say that the church is wrong. There's a little bit of a difference. I struggle with living this out. I struggle with how I'm going to do this. I struggle and sometimes I fail. I fail to live up to these teachings. That's different. Now, actually, there's a lot of mercy. You'll find a lot of mercy from almost any priest and bishop in terms of that because we struggle with some of these things because these things call us to a higher bar. But to struggle with something is very different than the church is wrong. I disagree with this, and I'm not going to abide by it. It's very different. We'll get into that more when we get into the fourth commandment. So the question becomes, for us, who is God? Where we've been before, we've talked about the last couple of classes that we've all experienced God in some way just by the fact that we're here. And that God communicates to us, reveals things to us, which is also what I'm talking about, the revelation of God that happens through the scriptures, but also continues to happen through the church. The Holy Spirit speaking to us today to reveal, to speak, that God speaks to all of us subtly within nature and within our hearts. But he also speaks at times explicitly. He speaks to us explicitly in the lives of the patriarchs in the Old and the New Testaments. And that we find that all of these things need uh, interpreters, which is why you have all the different understandings of Scripture. I'm trying to get to it. There we go. That Scripture is God speaking to us in the whole of humanity. And tradition is, again, that valid interpretation by interpreters. One. Did I, am I on the right one? Just a second. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let's go here. Another way of looking at tradition, the tradition is the ongoing presence of God leading humanity throughout history. Because if you don't have anything after the Bible, then where's the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit? And the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit is found in what we call tradition. And so there's also authority within the tradition of the church as well. So, one of the things, though, which I often hear more than anything else about God, when people come and ask me, they're like, I like the God of the New Testament. I don't like the God of the Old Testament. Has anyone ever heard this? Anyone ever said this? I've, I've said that <laughs> before I understood. See, a lot of people think of God in the Old Testament being almost like a Zeus-type figure who starts throwing lightning bolts at people, killing people when they don't do what he wants, and things like this. And actually, Zeus, if you understand even the Greek gods, the problem with the Greek